welcome to our verse-by-verse study of the Old Testament book of the minor prophet Zechariah. The book of Zechariah contains more visions and prophecies regarding Christ and the end times than all the rest of the minor prophets combined. The role of the prophet was to tell God's people what God thinks about them and what they are doing or not doing. God cares about his people and he cares about everything in their lives. The book of Zechariah reminds us of God's constant thoughts and teaches us about his plans for the future so that we have hope when we need it. So grab a cup of coffee, open your Bible to the book of Zechariah as we look for Christ in the Old Testament. Today we continue our series, turn to Zechariah chapter 9, Zechariah 9 as we continue our study through the Old, Mes- Old Testament minor prophet Zechariah. Slow down. You know, the reason why we do the monthly Future Today Prophecy meeting, which we'll be doing after the service today, is because when we compare God's Word with what's going on in the world around us, we see, we see a lot of, lot of things that are pointing to, you know, God doing what He said He was going to do. We see God's Word connecting and the stage being set for the fulfillment of those prophecies. The future can be a very disquieting thing. If we sit and we look at the world around us and maybe look at some things in our lives, it can be disturbing. It can be alarming. It can be fearful. There's lots of things going on. It could be health things. We've got, we've got a num- number of empty chairs here today because health things are going on in the church. We've got family that are struggling. We've got inflation that is running at record levels with no sign of it changing. I heard recently gas prices are going to go up again. What? How high can they go? Higher, I guess. (laughs) We're starting to hear about people laying off companies laying people off. Now, it would be awesome if the Bible told us how all of that was going to end, how it was going to end for us each individually, that, we could, that I, could, I could say, okay, this is going on in my life. Okay, I can, I can go to, you know, 1 Rick chapter 12 and find an answer to, you know, what the details of my life are. We don't know how all this is going to end, but God does. In Isaiah 46.10, it says, Declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. God, from before there was a single moment of time, before a single moment of time passed, God knew all of time, every bit, from the beginning to the end. From the very beginning, he knew how it was all going to go, every single thing, and not just the big ideas. But then God knew, you know, the kings and the, you know, the nations and the wars and all. He knew all that stuff. No, 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 he knows everything. He knows every minute detail of every single person from beginning to end to end I love that and that should fill us with wonder and awe to think that God knows all of that because if you combine that reality with what God says about his relationship to you it should give you great comfort because my Bible says that God loves you what kind of love with an with a in an infinite love, a love that is so beyond our human understanding that, that, we, that, we, that we will spend all of eternity trying to understand the extent of how much God loves us. You put that with knowledge, knowing God knows what's going on in my life, so if I don't understand what's going on in my life, that's okay, because he does. He loves me. He's caring for me. He's in control. He is sovereign. That means he is king of every single moment of my life and yours, everyone. 
There's nothing outside of his control. So it's, it's, it's comforting to me when I'm struggling to try to understand all of the stuff that's going on in the world around us, right? I mean, there's some stuff out there. We can't, okay, why is that happening? Why is it happening like that? You know, you know we, we, we look at some of these things and we just like, we shake our heads because we just don't get it. But God does. And so the question that we need to, we need to wrestle with and we need, to, we need to come up with an answer to is will we, as God's people, choose to believe that God knows our future? And not just that he knows it, but he has a plan for good in that future. Will we believe that? Because if you believe it, if you truly believe something, it will change how you live, right? I mean, is that not true? If you truly believe something, you need to believe something absolutely true, it will change, it will determine, it will dictate how you live your life, how you act in a certain situation. God knows your future, and he has a plan for it, a plan that is good. Let's pray, and then we'll ask the Spirit to speak to our hearts about God's plan for our futures. Heavenly Father, we do come thanking you. And while we might look at the world around us and, and, and just be, have all sorts of emotions attached to what's going on, not just in the, in the world, but in our own lives, to look ahead to a future that may be alarming, that may be frightening, that may be, may be dark, may be whatever. And, you know, we know, I know that in talking to people that not everyone is, looking towards a terrible future, that sometimes we look ahead and we see good things. We see, we see those, those special moments that come into every person's lives, and, and, and they're ahead of us as well. But Lord, what we, need, what we absolutely need to do, we need to understand, Holy Spirit, we need you to come right now and start doing a work in our hearts to help us to believe. You know the future and that you have a plan for it, and that that plan will come to pass. And there's nothing that anyone in the universe can do to stop it. And so I pray that you administer our hearts to give us that comfort, that peace, that joy of knowing, God, that you are in control and that you love us. And we lift this time up to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. In the first eight chapters of Zechariah, the message was primarily to the people of Jerusalem, primarily, dealing with the times that they were in. Starting with chapter 9, we see a shift. 9 all the way through the end of, the, of Zechariah are almost exclusively about the future from the perspective of Zechariah. Now, we're looking back, you know, 2,700 years, and so some of the things that, that Zechariah saw as future are now past. They're past to us, but not all of them. Some of them are still future. So we're going to see a combination, remembering that from Zechariah's perspective, it's all future. But from our perspective, we need to discern the, the stuff that has passed, the prophecies that were fulfilled with the ones that remain unfilled. And we see some of those in our text today. Zechariah is going to, going to start by uh, with a proclamation of judgment in the first part of this and then right in the middle of this chapter there is a, a verse that many of you are going to recognize very familiar verse that we don't always associate it with Zechariah so Zechariah starting in Zechariah chapter 9 verse 1 the burden of the word of the Lord against the land of Hadrach and Damascus its resting place for the eyes of men and all the tribes of Israel are on the Lord. Also against Hamath, which borders on it, and against Tyre and Sidon, though they are very wise, for Tyre built herself a tower, heaped up silver like dust and gold, like the mire of the street. Behold, the Lord will cast her out. He will destroy her power in the sea, and she will be devoured by fire. Now, if we were, if we were in the Tuesday morning Bible study, we'd spend about a week on on this or a couple of weeks on this these four verses there's a lot here we're not going to be able to spend that much time on it this morning but all of these nations 
had a mixed relationship with Israel throughout history. Sometimes they were friendly-ish toward Israel. Sometimes they weren't. They had one thing in common. They all worship false gods. And so we see God dealing with them in this, in this context. He's going to deal with them. And, and, and we, we saw this prophecy partially fulfilled. It's going to be ultimately fulfilled later. But it was partially fulfilled a couple hundred years after Zechariah. Is you know, when Alexander the Great. We know Alexander the Great, fascinating study if you want to get into just studying his life. Very short life, but very influential life. He, uh, the story is he received a vision telling him that he ought to go and conquer the whole world. And that, 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 that he had divine help on his side. So he makes this journey from Macedonia, starts coming down, and ends up in this area where, where we're talking about right now. And he was very effective. Um, Tyre, for example, when he got down to Tyre, Tyre was a, a very uh, commercially oriented city, very powerful, lots of money. And uh, they, had, they had been, so many people had been trying to conquer them for hundreds of years. The Assyrians came in. They spent five years laying siege to them. Didn't, didn't get them. They had the, the, the people of Tyre had an island offshore, about half a mile offshore, with a walls that were 100 feet tall. People couldn't get in. Babylonians came a little bit later. They spent 13 years there and couldn't get in. Alexander the Great comes in and in five months wipes them out. He builds, it's a fascinating story, he builds a, a basically a land bridge from the mainland to the island and then wipes them out, fulfilling God's prophecy against the city. Well, after that, he goes down, he continues his campaign southward. Verse 5, Ashkelon shall see it and fear. Gaza also shall be very sorrowful. And Ekron, for he dried up her expectation the king shall perish from Gaza, and Ashkelon shall not be inhabited. A mixed race shall settle in Ashdod, and I will cut off the pride of the Philistines. I will take away the blood from his mouth, the abominations from between his teeth, speaking of his, their really terrible uh, religious practices. But he who remains, even he shall be for our God, and shall be like a leader in Judah, and Ekron like a Jebusite. The Philistines lived in the area around where we know uh, the Gaza Strip, down in that area along the coastland south and west of Israel. <clears throat> and they were perennial enemies of Israel. They were always against Israel. A thorn in the side they were for their entire existence. It's interesting, he, he compares them to the Jebusites, that they would become like the Jebusites. The Jebusites were the people that were living in Jerusalem before David showed up and conquered the city. Well, when he conquered the city, he didn't do as, as many of them did in that day and wipe out all the inhabitants. He just kind of displaced them, and they end up being kind of uh, commingled with the people of Israel. And so the suggestion is that's what's going to happen here as well, though it may not be until the second coming where that totally is fulfilled. But one of the reasons is there the blood and the abominations, which we can uh, <clears throat> understand as being some of the practices they did. We're not going to talk about them this morning, but they're pretty barbaric. Verse 8 is interesting. Like, not, like it's not all interesting. Um, he says in verse 8, I will camp around my house because of the army, because of him who passes by, and him who returns, no more shall an oppressor pass through them, for now I have seen with my eyes. As Alexander the Great, he started up in the north, came down, he's on his way to Egypt to take out Egypt, and then he was going to go back. So he has to go right by Israel, right through Israel to get down to Egypt, and then he was going to come back. Josephus, the historian, tells a story that Alexander had received this vision telling him to, to basically go on this campaign, this conquest, and believe that he was going to have divine help in the process. And it appears that he did because he did things that seemed to be impossible 
as he was doing that. So after he had finished with Tyre, his plan was to come down after he had, after he had dealt with the, the Philistines and then to go to Israel, to go to Jerusalem and take out Jerusalem. And as he approached Jerusalem, out marches the high priest and some of the other priests. They're all, the, all the priests are dressed in white, and the high priest is wearing his priestly garments. And, as, and the story, Josephus says that when Alexander saw the high priest, he fell on his face to the ground in worship. So he says the high priest was dressed in the same clothes as the man that appeared to him in the vision that told him to go down there. And he said, you know what? And so he left Jerusalem alone. He went down to Egypt, dealt with Egypt. On his way back, he left Israel alone again on the way back. Whether that story is true or not, the historians, historians have to decide, but the point is there was no reason for Alexander not to take out Israel. There was no reason. He was, he was taking out everybody in his path. He walked, he marched right past Jerusalem, not touching it, went down to Egypt on his way back, still didn't touch Israel. God said, I will camp around my people and no one will touch them. Is that not still true today? And the answer is yes. Israel is, 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 God's got a plan for them. It's not gonna change. It doesn't matter what they do. Well, they may experience his discipline, but they're still his people. And he will camp around them. And we as God's people can understand that too, that he's made promises to us as well. That we don't have to, we don't have to you know, fret and worry and concern ourselves. We just have to be. We have to believe. When we walk in faith, we can walk boldly in our faith knowing that God has made promises to us and as long as we stay on his path that that it's just going to be okay. Maybe not easy. Maybe not fun. Maybe not prosperous. But it'll be good because he is good. God protected the Jews and he will protect them today. He will protect them tomorrow. He'll protect them in the future because he still has a plan for them. Next is the kind of the key verse in the chapter, verse 9. It's that familiar verse. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just in having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. You Bible students are probably thinking of the of of the the event that happened in in Jerusalem that relates to this this verse. All four gospels point to the event that this talks about. We refer to it as the triumphal entry. For the people in Zechariah's time, we've got to remember, everything that we read, all the prophecies, they, they meant something to the first people that read them, to heard them. They had some meaning that was important to them, even though it may have a future fulfillment. And for the people of Zechariah's time, the idea of a king, they didn't have a king at that time, the idea of a king coming to them was very pleasing. It was very appealing to them especially one who was just and has salvation. Remember, they're coming out of 70 years of exile to Babylon, which the Babylonians were not typically just. They had been just delivered from that, but still, it was a tough time. You know, there's a a verse in Proverbs I think we can all relate to right now. Proverbs 29, verse 2. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when a wicked man rules... The people groan. There's a lot of groaning going on right now. I don't know if you've noticed that. We're told some things about the character of this king. He is just. That's such a powerful word. That means, first off, it means he is right. Uh, That he is, in, in the context of a religious standpoint, that means he is right with God but it also carries the, the tone or the, the, uh, the, the deeper meaning that he is righteous, that he always does what is right. Also that he has salvation, that he is coming as a deliverer, as a savior. He's lowly, 
which means he's humble, which is not normally the characteristic of a king. Paul said this about Christ, Philippians 2, interesting that Stephen read right after this. Philippians 2, verse 6, being in the form of God, did not consider it a robbery to be equal with God, made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. If you have your Bibles open or your devices open, turn to John chapter 12, John 12. The next thing about, the next description we see is often misunderstood. It says that this king will come riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. To us, in our culture, in our way of thinking, a donkey is a lowly beast of burden that we don't really esteem them. You know, some, like Kelly, would say, oh, they're so cute. But we don't, we don't esteem them as, as something important. To Zacharias here, they would have been, it would have meant something completely different than what we would have thought of. You know, when we think of Jesus riding into Jerusalem on that donkey, we think of it as an expression of his humility. That's not what it meant. In Zechariah's time, for someone to ride a donkey was a symbol, was meant to represent that they were coming in peace. If they were not coming, if they're not coming on a donkey, if they're riding a horse, it meant something completely different. A horse symbolized war. And so when, when this king comes riding the donkey, it comes as a symbol. He is coming in peace. All four gospels record this event that we call the triumphal entry. In John chapter 12, we'll just read a few of these verses here in John 12, starting in verse 12. It says this, The next day a great multitude had come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees, and went out to meet him, cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. What are they saying about this man riding on this donkey? This man is King of Israel. Then Jesus, when he found a young donkey, sat on it as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. Jesus had come to make a way for fallen mankind to be at peace with God. And he made that peace through the cross. Turn back to Zechariah, Zechariah 9. After Jesus died, was buried, and then raised from the dead, his disciples remembered. It's not hard to imagine in, in, the, in, the, in the passion of the moment all these things are going on. You know, Jesus is betrayed. He's taken to the false trial, several of them. And then he's beaten and scourged and humiliated. You, you, if you try to put yourself in the disciples' place, it's hard to imagine thinking, hey, you know what? I think so-and-so wrote about this. I think Zachariah wrote about this in the, in the past. No, their minds wouldn't have been there. They would have been caught up in the emotion and the fear and the anger and all these emotions would have been racing through them. But it was only after, only after, after Jesus had gone through that and died, buried in the, in the ground for three days and then raised the dead and then glorified up there. Hey, wait, hey, wait a minute. I think to, I remember these things. Hundreds of years earlier, these things were written. The next time Jesus comes, and he is coming back, what do we say? Amen. Come on, church. <laughs> Amen. Come on, he's coming back. Yeah. Soon and very soon, somebody say. Okay, I'll say it. Soon and very soon. He's not going to be riding a donkey. 
He's going to be riding a war horse. And he'll be coming to overthrow his enemies, to establish his kingdom on this earth that will never, ever end. Revelation 19, 11, Now I saw heaven open, behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. Jesus came the first time. He didn't come to do that. He didn't come to, to judge and make war. He came to defeat sin once and for all. He came to make a way for us to be at peace with God and then with each other. Verse 9 refers to the first coming. Verse 10 jumps ahead to the second coming. Verse 10. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. The battle bow shall cut off, shall be cut off. He shall break, yeah. He shall speak peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river. When you see that word, the river, like that, it means the Euphrates River, to the ends of the earth. How far will his, this, this king's dominion range? Ultimately, to the ends of the earth, which means the whole earth, from sea to sea. When Jesus comes back, the whole earth will receive him as king. This idea of cutting off the chariot and the horse means that these symbols, these these implements of war will be done away with because there'll be no use for them. No longer will they make these things. No longer will they need these tools of war and violence because Jesus will reign. And when Jesus reigns, you don't need that stuff anymore. And if Jesus reigns in our heart, we could say the same thing. The tools and implements of war that often have so much power and authority in our hearts and lives, they're not necessary anymore. The mean and ugly words that we might use, the bad thoughts, We don't need them anymore. We can be at peace. When Jesus comes back, the whole world will receive him as king. Isaiah 45, 23. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that to me every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall take an oath. We, we probably more familiar with the New Testament version of that verse, and that is what Paul said in Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus <clears throat> every knee should bow, of those in heaven and those on the earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There's a day coming that while the world right now is racing toward destruction, racing toward selfish and and self-exaltation and all the other things the world is, is, is so enamored with, while re- disregarding or ignoring or, or despising God in the process, it's going to be a day when all that's going to end. And we, as his people, ought to be in a place where this describes us, that at his name, that when, when, when his name pops into our mind, when, when we hear it, when we speak it, that something happens inside of us, that our heart bows before him. That all the stuff that we might be clamoring after, that we might be chasing after, we might be wrestling with, we might be worrying about, we might be afraid of, all of that is laid at his feet. Because there is nothing in this universe that he is not sovereign over. If he's king in your heart, he's king over everything in your life. And when, that, when his name comes into your mind, whatever else you're holding in your hands, it ought to be laid right down at his feet. The rest of this chapter is a a promise 
to the Jews of God's protection, something that, that we should never forget. God's attitude toward the Jews is so important because there, there is a temporal reality to it. But if God made promises to the Jews and everywhere we go throughout his Bible, we see him reaffirming and reconfirming those promises, we also know that he made promises to his people, the church. And if he made promises to the Jew that he's going to keep, that means the promise he made to us are, he's going to keep as well. Not to mention the fact that God's called us into a relationship with the nation of Israel that we should never despise and we should never forget. Verse 11. As for you also, because of the blood of your covenant, I have set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to the stronghold, you prisoners of hope. Even today I declare that I will restore double to you for I have bent Judah my bow, fitted the bow with Ephraim, and raised up your sons, O Zion, against your sons, O Greece, and made you like a sword of a mighty man. Then the Lord will be seen over them, and his arrow will go forth like lightning. The Lord God will blow the trumpet and go with whirlwinds from the south. The Lord of hosts will defend them, his people Israel. They shall devour and subdue with sling stone. They shall drink and roar as with wine. They shall be filled with blood like basins, like the corners of the altar. The Lord their God will save them in that day as the flock of his people. And they shall be like the jewels of a crown, lifted like a banner over his land. For how great is its goodness, that is the land, how great is its beauty, grain shall make the young men thrive, and the new wine, the, the young women. This is pointing to a time of great prosperity. And as we study the Bible, especially the, the, the end times things, which we're going to talk about a little bit after the, after the service today, you know, there's a period of time called the millennium. And in the millennium, the, the prosperity is, is, is amazing. You know, that everybody is going gonna, is gonna to prosper during that time, especially, I believe, the Jews. Jesus will be king of the world, and, and he will be in complete control. All of his enemies will be vanquished. And then, and, then, and then this time will begin. When the Messiah returns, all of the captives will be freed, um, and this celebration of prosperity will just last well at least for a thousand years and then and then whatever comes after that god has a glorious future plan for the jews a glorious future plan for the jews and we should we should never lose sight of that because god calls us into this 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 relationship with them that that will that is beneficial not just to them but to us as well and even though the jews of Zechariah's time might not have been able to imagine such a time, and I'm guessing the ones today don't imagine it either. It was nonetheless promised to them. You know, their belief in that future couldn't change the fact that it was, it was and it was coming. I mean, the same thing is true for us. Regardless of your circumstance, regardless of your situation, regardless of what you see in the world around you, if God's made promises to you, it, it, it will come. If you have your Bibles, still have your Bibles open, which you should, turn to John 14. Too early for the zippers. At the beginning of the message, I asked, I suggested, I encouraged, that if, if, have we chosen to believe that God knows the future and not just knows the future, he's in control of the future and that his future includes good for me, for you. Do we believe that? Have we chosen to believe that? In John chapter 14, Jesus had just, before that, Jesus had just told his disciples that he was leaving to go back to heaven. And his disciples were upset. They were bothered by that. Probably because they weren't really sure what that meant for them. Life had been interesting for the last three years for the disciples. 
And if Jesus is going away, well, what, 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 what does that mean for me? What does that mean for us? Jesus says to them in John 14, verse 1, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you, he says to his disciples and to all of those who will believe. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Can we say that as a promise? Is it true? Is it true for you? Yes. And that's the attitude we ought to have. When we come to God's word, we ought to look at this and see, is this true? Well, if it's God's word, the answer is always, yes, it is true. But sometimes we struggle to make that connection. Yes, it's true, but is it true for me? God will do that for John. I'm just not sure he's going to do it for me. Uh, that's not the way God's word works. Where is Jesus right now? He's in heaven. He said, that's where I'm going. I'm going. I'm going to be with my Father. I'm going to be the right hand to power. That's where I'm going. That's where I'll be until I come and get you. Jesus isn't here right now. We can't, we can't see him. We can't touch him. We can't hear his voice. We can't, we can't ask him questions. We can't, we can't touch him. We have to do that by faith now and that's exactly what we do god calls us to reach out to touch jesus by faith to talk to jesus by faith to see jesus by faith by believing god's word by believing what it says here that these words are true they are they are true now they were true two thousand years ago they're true today. They'll be true however long it takes for Jesus to finish building your mansion. And they'll be true when he comes and gets you because they're always true. The world I, I see around me is a mess. It can be a little bit discouraging watching those things that call themselves news. The future just doesn't seem to offer anything that I can describe as good, that I can put my hope in. But I choose to believe God. I choose to believe that what his word says is true, and it's true for me. I choose to believe that his spirit lives in me. I choose to believe that his spirit is here to help me, to lead me, to guide me, to empower me. I choose to believe that God has good in store for me and for all of us. And because I choose to believe those things, I can live in this world that's going where it's going with hope. The future... I may not like what I see, but I know that God is in that future. God is already in that future. That God is already working good in that future, even if I can't see it, even if I don't understand it, even if I don't know how to, how to get myself there, he's there. And because he loves me, because he... <laughs> He calls me one of his. I know that he's going to care for me there. Whatever the future brings, God is already there. And, and, and I, I can only speak for myself, will choose to trust him in there. Even if I don't like it, even if I don't like what's going on, even if I can't see good, I'm going to choose to trust him for the good that he's promised. Because he is good. And because I know he loves me. Randy is going to come up here in a moment and lead us in communion. Which reminds us of just how much God.
God loves us. Amen. Thank you for joining us on this exciting journey through the book of Zechariah. It is our hope that these messages will help you to grow in your faith. If there's anything that we can do to help you with that, don't hesitate to connect with us. You can do that by going to calvaryfv.com slash connect, and you'll find all the ways that you can connect with us there. As Christians, we are all connected in Christ. And one of the ways that we would like to engage with you is in the area of prayer. Please let us know how we can be praying for you. You can send us an email to prayer at calvaryfd.com or text the word pray to 951-419-5396. If this material has been useful to you, please share it with someone. Also, please pray that God would use these messages to help others find hope in Jesus Christ. You can also partner with us financially by going to calvaryfv.com slash give or text the word give to 951-419-5396. Until next time, go be radical with Jesus.